Kids and stupid hills, right? I just felt like running, okay? That's what you wanted to say today to people who asked how church was. Well, pastor was doing poor stuff. <laughs> so uh, we, we, we have seen the movie, and if we remember, most of it, he's on the bench and he's kind of telling what occurred to his life, when really the movie is like he's only going a couple blocks away to see his ex-girlfriend, okay? Uh, I had to take a lot of film classes if you've seen Pulp Fiction, not endorsing it, but the movie is told all different ways, most of which are in flashback. Now, Del and I absolutely love, our favorite movie, I think, Del, is Lonesome Dove. Have we seen Lonesome Dove? Okay, we're stopping right now. We're going to watch it, okay? <laughs> That's how good it is. It's probably my all-time favorite. And at the end, you have Robert Duvall, and you've got uh, Tommy Lee Jones. And at the end, Tommy Lee Jones, he is asked by a reporter. He's asked by a reporter, hey, man, what's going on? How come you, how come you took your friend 3,000 miles to bury him? They say you're a man of vision, and he, and he stops. And what the film does is it goes into his face, and it shows flashbacks. Okay, and it shows a whole bunch of flashbacks. He begins to tear up because he's remembering, you know, if you're going to be a man of vision, it's going to cost you friends. It's going to cost you a lot of sacrifice, etc. And so today, no, and keeping in mind, right? Okay, flashbacks. That's what we're looking at. We know from chapter 11, we know Jesus is going to win. We're all going to be saying, wow, this is incredible. But now we pause, and that brings us to verse 1 as a flashback. Okay, and again, the flashback will take approximately two chapters. Okay, so anyone that starts telling you, well, didn't Revelation say X, Y, and Z? Yes, it did, but we have to remember context. This is a flashback like those movies. Okay, so verse 1, a great sign appeared in heaven. Okay, it was a woman. She was clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. She was with child. She cried out, being in labor and in pain to give birth. Another sign appeared in heaven, and behold, a, a great red dragon having seven heads, ten horns, and on his heads were seven crowns. His tail swept away a third of the stars in heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon, she stood before, excuse me, the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she gave birth, he might devour the child. And the, and the woman, she gave birth to a son, a male child, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman, she fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God, so that there she might be nourished for 1,260 days. Verse 7. Then there was a war in heaven, Michael and his angels. They were waging war with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels, they were, they were waging war, and they, Satan and his angels, were not strong enough. There was no room, there was no longer room for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil, and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation, the power, the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the, accus the accuser of our brethren, he's been thrown down who has access, excuse me, who accuses them before God day and night. I mean, amen. amen. What an incredible passage here. Jason, would you mind praying for us here? Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time together. Um, we ask that as Andrew speaks, um, we just uh, thank you, open our minds and hearts to what you have for us to learn more about just the wisdom of your eyes and everything that you need to score us, uh, even the things we may not know. Um, that we just know the name of Jesus Christ. In your son's name, we just pray. Amen. 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 Again, we're we're in Revelation, and you guys, you guys know this. I don't I don't want to beat it to death, but it's so important we understand what's taking place. Again, we, we just blew, woohoo, the seventh trumpet. It gives, it's victory, victory in Jesus right here. And we had, um, uh, again, if we're in chapter 11, chapter 11, you would see that uh, starting in verse 15 through 17, that, that this is set in stone. The trumpet's been blown, victory's assured. Okay, hallelujah. Uh, again, we talked last week that this is a prophetic uh, statement that even though it hasn't occurred, it's set in stone, just like we say, death and taxes, right? There's only one thing certain in life, death and taxes. Okay, so for here, Jesus, it's over. We, he's going to win. We saw verse 18 and 19. 
Verse 18 and 19 is going to, what's coming up now that Jesus is one? Well, there's going to be a final rebellion. There's going to be a time of judgment. Time of judgment, right? We're going to stand before the Lord. And, of course, we know that uh, this, this trumpet starting at approximately chapter 15 is going to open up those horrible, horrible bowls, the last woe. And that brings us to, to chapter 12, verse 1, where uh, I love this. The Holman Christian Bible, it says this is a timeout. This is a little timeout right here, okay? Have you guys had to go to timeout? It's pretty intense, isn't it? Like, oh, that's miserable. This is a, a timeout of what's taking place. Basically, how did Satan deceive everyone? Seriously, how do you pull that off, right? And so we're going to get to know a little bit more, uh, unfortunately or unfortunately, about this, this horrible villain. This horrible villain, right? We've got Darth Vader, right? Satan surpasses all these villains. He's the worst of the worst. And so verse 1, before we get to Satan, John says there's a sign. Okay, so let's look at verse 1. There's a great sign, and it appeared in heaven. It appeared in heaven. A woman, she was clothed with the sun and the moon, under her feet and on her head, there was a crown of 12 stars. Okay, you guys can see the visual up there. I, I tried to find as many practical ones as possible. Again, if you Google Revelation, tell you what, folks, you will see thousands, if not millions, of very disturbing things. Uh, but this one's fairly practical. And I want you guys to look here at the word sign. Okay, the word sign, just so important. It's where we get the name Simeon. Okay, it's so where we get the name Simeon. But this is the first of seven before the, the book of Revelation is done. And a sign, of course, points to something, right? Some kind of reality. Uh, and the Greek is very, very clear that this is pointing to something that is certain. And for example, as you see up on the screen there, I know a lot of you, you judge me because I'm from California. And so when you see that sign on I-5, welcome to Oregon. I see some head nods. That's right. Be gone, Satan. Yeah, you're like, I don't want this guy here in our church, right? He's from California. I had a guy to this day in Glide, like, he would tell his kids he's from California. And I was like, really, man? That's how you're going to raise him? Blame and means? Like, I was born there. That's all that happens, okay? But it's a, it's a sign, symbolic as well as, like, now you're in Oregon, okay? So what we're seeing is things that we very clearly, there's no real debate about what's taking place here because it points to that reality. And so we know right here in verse 1 that we've seen these things before, okay? We've seen this before. Where have we seen it? Genesis 37, right? Joseph has this dream and, and the, his brothers didn't like him. Why? Because everything revolved around him and he's going to be, quote, worshipped. He's going to be the king where they're all bowing down before him. And here we have the same kind of initial reading. And then it says there's 12 stars on this crown. There's 12 tribes of Israel. It's very, very clear that we're talking about Israel. Okay, so what's going to happen? Well, Israel, verse 2, she's with, she's with child, right? The Messiah is going to come from the lineage of Israel. Everyone, even Jews to this day, believe that. And we see... She's in pain. Why? Because she's giving birth, right? She's, she's in labor. And, and again, that goes back to Genesis chapter 3, right? Man is going to, for the sin, man's going to have sweat of his brow. It's going to stink to work, right? You moms out there, the pain of labor, right? How come you had three, right? After one, we're done. And it just, it's too much agony, right? And so here, verse 2, this woman, she's in pain, giving birth. And uh, just so you know, it's on your notes. I, I, don't, I don't think I put it on there. Yeah, I did not put uh, this on. But uh, there's four other women that are going to occur. Okay, four other women that are going to occur from this point forward. And they are all just diametrically opposed. You've got Israel, right? She's the first one mentioned here. We've got Jezebel, which I know some of our guys preached on. That she's going to be preaching uh, and teaching and deceiving people about sexual sin. And that will come up, especially uh, in chapter 16 and 17. We've got the church, right? A bride prepared for our, our husband, the lamb, right? That, that's Jesus Christ getting heaven prepared for us. And then, of course, we have the scarlet woman, that, that basically fake believers, the apostate church. And so we're going to see all these from right here, verse 2 onward, all these different, these different women. And starting with Israel, she's in pain. Verse 3. What happens to her as she begins to give birth? Well, John says there's another sign. What was it? 
there was a great red dragon having seven heads. How many horns? Ten horns. And how many crowns did this dragon have? Well, he had seven. Some of you may have the phrase a, a, a diadem, but it basically means it's really shiny. It's a really shiny power of authority, which is a crown. And again, uh, if you look there, you'll see the picture on the screen here. This dragon, right? There's a whole bunch of them. I'm sorry, it was, it's, it's probably not a little dark, but there are crowns on there. Uh, the woman, of course, is giving birth. And what's with all these crowns that this great red dragon has? Well, we're going to see later that, that basically the nations are going to give authority to this figure. Okay, so picture our president or whichever president. Uh, chancellor of, of the country, whatever it is, hey, we're, we're behind you, Antichrist. We're behind you, Satan. And so I'm going to give you my authority on behalf of this nation. And so Satan, as we know, is, the, is literally the prince of this world, and he's going to take over that. Okay, he's going to take that on. And, and he, of course, all throughout past history has used nations to do his, his bidding. And we see that he has seven heads, ten horns. And there's seven crowns. If you look at the word dragon on the screen here, this is just so powerful, okay? So powerful. It's a large sea creature. It's where we get the word Leviathan. And it's, it's basically those, those really big stories of Odyssey, right? Just some kind of weird little mermaid creature coming out of the, the Disney stuff, right? Because this is just weird. It's where the word comes from. And it's a massive, massive, disgusting-looking animal. Okay? And this is the villain of all villains right here, guys. Now, I can't speak for you guys, but uh, my son right now, he is in the dinosaur mode. And he loves dinosaurs and Legos, and he loves dinosaurs knocking over Legos, right? He can pretend to be King Kong. But man, when we talk about dragons, he just gets like, what does the dragon look like? Does it breathe fire? Like, he just comes alive. There's something about dragons. They're, they're massive in scale. They're massive in their, just their territory and how they scare people. There's this, this fascination with them. And Satan takes it on, and it's horrible. It's horrible, horrible stuff. What happens? Verse 4, he's going to try to kill this Messiah. That's Jesus, the baby, right? Satan is represented not only in dominating the world, but the seven crowns clearly show indication that he has taken over the nations of the world, present, past, and in the future, as we'll see. And now he has tried to stop God's people with every inch of his body. So I want to pause right here before we look at verse 4. Are we ready? Glendale Baptist Church, right here. Satan hates your guts. He hates anyone that follows Jesus and anyone that is even remotely related to Jesus. He hates you. This isn't like let's reach across the aisle politically and sing kumbaya and, and vote at 1159 to give our politicians a raise. Let's come together for the good of the pay raise. This is I hate your guts because you follow Jesus. Are we clear? He doesn't ever, ever want to do anything other than accuse and abuse. Are we clear? I, I mean, I appreciate the amen. But yeah, I mean, this is like, whoa. Okay, so Satan not only hates us as believers. But there's one group of ethnicity or people that he hates just as much. It's God's chosen people. Okay, verse 4. His tail, it swept away a third of the stars in heaven, and it threw them to earth. And the dragon stood before the woman. And the woman was about to give birth. And what was his one intention to do? To devour the child. Folks, that means when Jesus lay in a manger, who was right there doing everything he could to kill that child. Satan, okay? And how did he do that? King Herod, folks, read it. I mean, Matthew, Luke. I mean, what did the king do when the wise men said, hey, we, we, we want to see and worship the Messiah? King Herod was nothing more than a vessel, guys, to kill Jesus, to kill the baby Jesus. That is what Satan is all about. He hates everything about God. He's the opposite. He opposes him in every capacity, and that means little children. These little children, I mean, what a shock. What a coincidence. Our country has killed 60 million babies, right? This is all Prince of Darkness stuff right here. And Satan, he does not in any capacity love you. He wants to abuse you. And we see in verse 4, he did everything he could to literally consume this baby. The idea of devour, right? Just completely, it is engulfed in flame. It will not be the Messiah. Guys, what better way? 
to stop the plan of God than to literally kill the Messiah. What better way to stop salvation from occurring than getting the adult Jesus to sin, right? You can't have a Savior that is not perfect. And so if you're really the Son of God, throw yourself down. If you're really the Son of God, turn these rocks into food, right? He doesn't like us. He doesn't care for us. He hates God. He hates Jesus. So I'm going to try to kill him as a baby. If I can't get that, I'm going to try to kill him. I'm going to try to kill him or tempt him to sin. And then, of course, on the cross, right? Like, just give it up, man. Just come on down, right? You don't think there was spiritual warfare going on the day Jesus was crucified? Get out of here. Oh, man, I cannot have this occur. Satan has to stop this because he hates God's people. He hates Christians and he hates Jews. And God's chosen people, man, they have a special place, don't they? They have a special place. I remember I was uh, probably eight or nine years old and, and, and one of the presidents over in Israel, and I don't remember what was going on, but Tom Brokoff was on the news. You guys remember that? NBC, right? Tom Brokoff. And uh, he was on there and something was happening over in the Middle East. And guess what? I don't know what happened. But my mom and dad told me that immortal words, you always support Israel. And I remember, like, why? Why would you do that? Honey? I don't know why, because my mom and dad are like, hey, we're not scholars, right? We're not historians, but we know that God is going to use his people. Amen? Like, it is going to happen. We know there's going to be revival. And so support Israel. If you guys were to pull out a map right now, oops, excuse me. If you were to pull a map up right now of Israel, you know what you would see as a nation? It's completely surrounded by what? By Muslim nations. That's totally coincidental, right? Totally just a total. No, this is a direct attack by the Prince of Darkness, the worst villain of all time, and it's Satan. Don't be deceived, okay? And God is going to, of course, use Israel. Hallelujah. The woman and salvation come from Israel. And we as Gentiles, man, we're part of that family, aren't we? Hallelujah. Salvation has come to all. Look at verse 5. She gave birth to a son. Yes. She gave birth to Jesus, a male child. You'll find him, right, swaddling in a manger. And he is to rule all nations with a rod of iron. This child was caught up to God and to his throne. I just want to pause here, guys. If you have a highlighter, pen, mark this verse in your Bible, because this is just truly a special, sacred, and dare I say, an innocent verse. It is so profound and special. The first thing is, it, it, it's Psalms chapter 2 is being quoted again. But what is so powerful, so powerful, is the word rule. It's the word rule, okay? Do you, do you see it up there? It means to shepherd. Satan hates you. He wants to abuse you. He wants to rule you. He literally wants to be an authoritarian figurehead as God. He wants to be God. He's in direct opposition to God. Here is our Savior, and he wants to shepherd. What does a shepherd do? He nourishes, right? He tends to them. He cares for you. I mean, guys, look at the word, the phrase there. He's going to rule all nations. He's going to shepherd Everyone with a rod of iron. And, and, and as you look at that rod of iron, guys, this isn't a Rambo moment. You're like, yo, man, I'm going to just show you how it's done and I'm going to kill every bad guy. This is a, just a special, special thing. The phrase rod of iron, guys, it's a shepherd's staff. And what does a shepherd's staff do? It guides us, doesn't it? It leads us beside still water. Your rod and your staff, they, they comfort me. Psalms 23. It's one of the most famous psalms ever. And here is Jesus. He's going to rule us because he cares for us. He's going to rule us and he wants to take care of you. Hallelujah. This is direct opposition. But you see why we're deceived in America. Our country was literally founded on life, liberty, and the pursuit of your happiness. And that is, I mean, I tell you what, Satan just goes right with that, man. You should rule your life. You should do whatever you want. Don't let anyone tell you anything different. Right? Free love. Go do what you want, man. That is, a, that is a lie, isn't it? Okay? I mean, it founded a great country, obviously. But we also see a lot of people are going to be led astray. Because that deception in our heart. And here's Jesus. I want to guide you. I want to truly, truly tend and nourish you. And I, I tell you guys, if you haven't bought this book, buy this book. Here's my, my book of the century right here. Right here. This one right here. Gentle and lowly. Jesus. Our Savior said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest, right? My, my yoke is easy. 
Guys, the idea there is uh, I'm gentle and lowly. Our Savior not only loves you and cares for you, but his literal essence is one of tenderness and care for us as a shepherd to sheep. Isn't that amazing? It's the direct opposite of Satan who wants to abuse you, wants to accuse you. Frankly, he wants to tell, tell you and accuse you before God that you're a loser. Like, man, God doesn't even need that Andrew fellow. Like, give up on it, right? He accuses, as we'll see in a little bit. And here's our Savior, verse 5. He wants to shepherd, and he will shepherd. And you see in verse 5 that, that God, of course, supernaturally takes care of him. What happened after Herod started killing babies in Matthew? Chapter 1, 2, and 3. Man, Joseph was told to get out of there. And a lot of scholars, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, he had money for the journey, didn't he? To, to get his stuff and get out. <laughs> wow. But the Lord protected him. Guys, we see this even all the way back. Check out Exodus chapter 1. Satan has gone to killing babies in the past, right? Moses was going to literally deliver the people of Israel, right? God knew that. God knew he was going to use uh, Moses. So who killed all those kids? Pharaoh, right? Pharaoh's like, I can't have this around. It is just frightening, frightening. It is pure evil, the lengths of which Satan will go to stop the work of God. You don't think he's doing that in Glendale right now? The community is in darkness. There's men, broken families, there's drugs all over. Like, we've only been here, what, two, almost two years? Like, you're, you're kidding me. Like, what? It's a broken, dark community. You don't think Satan wants that? He does not want this church to be a light. He doesn't want any of the churches to be a light. And he will go to any extent and extreme to prevent the word of God from getting out. You're dealing with the villain of all villains, Glendale Baptist Church. So put on the armor of God, right? <laughs> you don't wrestle against flesh and blood. You wrestle against spiritual forces of darkness in this world. Y'all better bring your game, right? Like, Jesus, I need you more. Verse 6. So the woman, after delivering... What else is going to happen? Obviously, we again, this is a sign. She's going to be fleeing, fleeing into the wilderness where God had prepared a place for her that she might be nourished for 1,260 days. Again, I cannot emphasize this enough. This is a flashback. We see the Messiah being born. But now, verse 6 is clearly within that tribulation period. Look at the, the 1,260 days. Clearly, we're within that seven-year window of horrific things happening. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we know one of those things will be a lot of persecution against Jewish individuals. Guys, Hitler killed how many Jews? Six million? That's going to pale in comparison to the Antichrist and Satan trying to kill as many of God's people during this time. And it's going to be horrific. Can we, can we just pause? Can I just, just pause here? Let's turn in our Bibles. I try not to do this too much because we can lose context but, context. but look at Matthew 24. Let's turn in our Bibles, okay? We'll go slow. Matthew 24. I know it's on the screen, but I want us to look at this. So important. The disciples ask, Jesus, when are these things going to happen? When are these things going to occur? And Jesus answers the disciples by taking them through by taking them through the tribulation, right? Don't be de de uh, deceived. In verse 15, look at verse 15. You know, when you see that the Antichrist is going to set himself up and be worshipped in the temple, which Daniel also prophesied. Okay, verse 16, let's look at that. Get out. Right? Look, those in Judea need to flee to where? Flee to the mountains. Get out. Look at verse 17. That the person who's on the house, okay? Remember, they didn't build houses like we have them. They would be all multiple levels, right? Get out. Don't even get your belongings. You are going to be killed that quickly. Verse 18. If you're working in the field because you're trying to grow crops to survive, don't even turn back. Just get out. That's how quickly the devastation towards God's people will occur. Verse 18. Excuse me, yeah, the field. Verse 19. Woe to those who are with child. Can women that are pregnant really move? I mean, I've seen my wife run a 5K, but her time was about 20 minutes slower than when she doesn't have a kid, right? It's like you can't really move, right? Don't, that, that, just woe to them. What about verse 20? Pray that your flight is not in the winter because it's harder and cold to, to travel, of course. Pray that it's not on a Sabbath. Guys, Jews, they're going to struggle with, should I 
honor the Sabbath and not work, or should I try to save my own life, right? That's going to be a struggle. Verse 21, there will be a great, great tribulation, mm -hmm. such as not has occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever. If the days hadn't been cut short, no one would survive. That's from Jesus saying the words of what will happen to Jewish individuals or those who trust Christ during this time. It is going to be a bloodbath. And if it weren't for God saying that's enough, it, no one would survive. Jesus said that. That is, that is an astronomical hatred for the things of God, isn't it? And that's Satan. That's Satan right there, folks. Wow. Unfortunately, a lowercase wow, right? Verse 7. Let's turn back to Revelation chapter 12. It's, it picks up here. Picks up here. Verse 7, 8, 9 kind of go together. There's this massive battle. And I know Jeremiah, man, we love Star Wars, right? For the record, I love the original Star Wars. I can't stand any of the other ones. Like, I'm just like, the quality is so bad. But there's this epicness, right? There's a Death Star out there, and they're fighting up there in, in, the, in, the, in the skies and the stars and the galaxy. Verse 7, there's a battle in heaven. Who's fighting? Michael. You haven't really seen this guy very much. But Michael and his army, his angels, are waging war with the dragon. And the dragon and his angels are waging war. And remember, Satan has deceived approximately a third of the angels to follow him. And so there's this massive battle. But verse 8, they were not strong enough. And there wasn't a place, there wasn't room in heaven for them. And so they are cast down to earth in verse 9. Again, if you, if you look up on the screen, we'll see a, there's that Leviathan-type picture from the sea monster, right? Kind of, kind of that dragon-type body fighting with Michael. But you see right here, Michael is, is throughout Scripture. And he is a, a very loyal angel to, to the Lord. Hallelujah about that. And he's fighting many battles that we never know about. But we see he's fighting here Satan. And Satan loses. And he's cast down. Look at verse 9. The dragon is thrown down into earth. The serpent of old who is called who? He's given two names. Look at them. He's given two names in verse 9. Devil and what? And Satan. Okay, we know that he also has another name, Lucifer. But let's look at this. So important, guys. His name, Diablos. Okay, it's a whole video game franchise, Diablo, okay? Uh, but you can see there it means to, to, to accuse, to slander. Okay, I want to be very, very practical right now. I want to be very, very practical. Satan not only hates you, not only does he hate the things of God, he hates the people of God. But Glendale Baptist Church, he stands before God and he tells and accuses before God about us. That Del fella, that Andrew fella, Justin, Justin Jr., it doesn't matter. Jason, all of us here, they're losers. You need to get rid of them, God. Did you see that last week about that secret sin that they had? You got to get rid of them. You got to get rid of them. You know that, that lady at that church, man, she's so, oh, dude, they just sin all the time. And what does a person that has Jesus Christ? God doesn't see that. What does he see? He sees Christ's righteousness. Be gone, Satan. That is not them. No, they're a child of God. This is so profound. This is so powerful. We'll get to it in just a minute. But we see that Satan accuses constantly. Oh, they're, they're just a loser. Just get rid of them. They're a horrible spouse. They're a bad parent. They are a bad employee. Right? He just accuses constantly before God. He even did it with Job. Job chapter 1. That guy's a righteous guy. No, he's not. If you just take away all his stuff, God will turn on you. But what does Job do? The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. But that's what Satan does. He accuses. And you see, he comes to earth. What does he do? In verse 9, he deceives the whole world. He's thrown down to the earth. The angel's thrown down with him. But he deceives the whole world. Guys, it means... He leads astray the entire world. That means India, Australia, America, Canada. He leads people astray. And then the believers, he accuses us before God all the time. This is a horrible villain, isn't it? This is a horrible, powerful villain. The reason, if you look at your notes, let's look at our notes really quick, that page. The reason I gave you was not a devotion. 
That's a study from George Barna. He's kind of the guru for, for, for just studies and stats and Christianity. And it's scary, folks. America not only is on a slippery slope, we're now we're on the rail, just like, woohoo, let's go down, man. Roller coaster, we're we're headed for crashing, right? We just had a month celebrating individuals dancing before kids in an inappropriate fashion. So kid, buckle up, because we're just headed down. But also look at the notes. That is for Mr. Barna, PhD. Guys, you guys need to be not, not afraid to challenge what the word of God is, what Andrew says, but like, look at how people even in Christian circles. It's not pretty, is it? Less than 40% actually have a quiet time. Less than 30% actively pray. Like this is this is not good stats. See exhibit A. Deceives the whole world, right? Satan deceives us as well, doesn't he? That sin that you're secretly hiding, it's really not that bad. It's really not that bad, right? You know, you could probably get away with it. These are little lies that we hear in our hearts, don't we? It's really not that bad. I want to pause right here. The entire passage kind of comes down to this right here. Not only does Satan, is he deceiving the entire world, but look at our universities. Come on, man. Philosophies like the, the world is in confusion. God, I just saw a senator this week talk about whether men can get pregnant. Are you kidding me? It's like, they're, they're just like you're kidding me. This deception is out of control. So many parents, they say, well, when my kid, he got to college age and fell apart and stopped following Jesus. No, he didn't. He was literally demonically deceived, most likely, by something that has been led astray. Okay, this is spiritual warfare. But look at verse 9. He deceives the entire world. We've got universities, cultures. We've got society. Again, men can be women, women can be like that. This is all deception from Satan. And so I want to pause right here and ask a difficult question. Deep breath, okay? So where are we at right now? Only you can answer this, but where are you at right now in your heart? Where are you the last couple of months making decisions? Have you let some things slide? Maybe your patterns in life, yeah, you know, I've been every fifth day having a quiet time. Maybe some decisions have not been godly. Only you can answer those things. But might I pose another question? Could it be that these are Satanic deceptions. Because he hates you. He does not want you to follow Jesus. He doesn't want to teach your kids about Jesus. And if I'm being totally honest, I want to just be <laughs> super upfront. <laughs> this is going to sound wrong. Fake news. But man, I tell you guys, I love preaching. I love, I love sharing what I've, I've learned this week. I love getting to know you guys. We love being here in Glendale. But I got to tell you right now, man, I hate something. The two hours to get here are like pulling teeth with our kids. And then they get here and they won't sit still. That's totally coincidental, isn't it? No, it's not. It's spiritual warfare. Satan doesn't want kids to know about Jesus. He doesn't want Andrew and Tanya to be focused on worshiping Jesus. He doesn't want the community that we're involved in that follow Jesus to influence their lives. Because, man, guys, when churches are involved in each other's lives for Jesus, man, lives change, don't they? Hallelujah. That's a local body of believers. Hallelujah. But, man, it's like pulling teeth. I, like, dread sometimes. I dread Sunday mornings. Like, who wants to discipline their kids as they get ready for church? I don't want them to have that subliminal subconscious, like, oh, great, I'm going to have some discipline before I go to church. You know what I'm saying? Like, how many kids stop following Jesus because the church, right? And maybe I was part of that. It just breaks my heart. I, I don't just pray for me. <laughs> but man, when you realize there's a spiritual battle against a guy that hates your guts, doesn't want your kids to succeed, is willing to kill children. It opens your eyes to how powerful verse 10 is. Let's get ready to say, one, two, three. Wow. Hey, let's get ready to say, wow, let's be ready to be uplifted. Verse 10, I heard a loud voice in heaven. Despite all this deception, despite all this battle from Satan, salvation, the power, the kingdom of our God and authority are whose? Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And he, the accuser, the, the accuser, our brethren, he's been thrown down who accuses before day and night, before God day and night. Guys, Satan is done. It's over the accuser that stands before God, nagging God about you and I and about our little sin problem, our lack of, 
or of humility or whatever. Like you're a bad parent, you're a bad boy, whatever. It's, it's been cast down. And folks, look at this. The word thrown down is where we get the word catapult. What do you do with a catapult? You know, Elijah, I mean, I know Kyle loves like, whoa, I mean, it's just send it down, right? Little boys love catapults, right? Let's throw that rock as far as we can, Dad. I remember even getting a slingshot, right? Just go, ching, you send it out there. God has literally said he's done. He's been sent down. He's now going to be tortured forever and ever. That accuser is done. And not only that, guys, but look at the, this is such a powerful verse. Salvation. I love this. It's not the gospel that you've been saved through faith and not of yourselves. This is salvation, deliverance in every kind of capacity as a believer in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. I mean, this is incredible. Right here. Right here. Jesus. Because Jesus he is giving you deliverance over sin. Amen? Amen? Like that means pornography. That means whatever issue, money, pride, something at work. You have victory over all of it right now because of Jesus. The kingdom and power of Jesus are all and in all. I mean, that is just incredible. John MacArthur writes, it's salvation in the broadest, widest possible sense. There is nothing in this broken world that can keep you from being saved by Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. I mean, hallelujah. So right there, guys, I cannot, I just cannot say this enough. But when you trust Jesus Christ, I'm going to get passionate here. That means you not only are saved, but you are not a loser. The accusations of Satan, you are a child of God. And you have victory. You are not a failure in whatever capacity you think you are. You are a child of God that has victory right now. You are not a bad spouse. You're not a bad person. You have been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. And you have deliverance. I don't know where you are right now, but if you don't feel something or lifted right there, there's not much I can do. <laughs> like this is from God's word. He's given salvation. He's gotten rid of the enemy, the accuser for all time. It's over. And if that isn't enough, the same guy that wrote Revelation John in 1 John chapter 2 to a different audience, different time place, he says, my dear children, I'm writing these things to you that when you sin, you have an advocate, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Verse 2, Jesus is the atonement for our sins. And not just ours, but for the entire world. Glendale Baptist Church, your debt has been paid. You are a child of God. You have victory. The old hymn of the faith is very appropriate as we close. Victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. Yeah. Hallelujah. I mean, this is incredible. Uh, so there's no more Star Wars moment. There's no more villain here. It's like, Satan, you're done. As we have our invitation today, man, 